welcome Jim Donahue from SUNY Potsdam. Tell me, so power of comics, this is what we're gonna talk about, welcome. Excellent, thank you for having me here. This is all, uh, it's fantastic. Excellent, okay, so look, you have done like a bunch of books, uh, Failed Frontiersman, Postal Satire, uh, edited volume, you've got your book on narrative um, uh, with Chris Gonzalez's series, but comics, how did you find your way to the study of comics? So, um, like a lot of us, I grew up reading comics. Um, I loved uh, particularly superhero comics. I was a big fan of Captain America, uh, Daredevil, and the Silver Surfer. And so I'd always had that interest. And it wasn't until I was working on my PhD that I saw that comics could be a place for serious academic study. Uh, I was very lucky in that the first year of my PhD was the last year or two at UConn when Charles Hatfield and Gene Cannonberg were doing dissertations on comics. And I, uh, I'd never thought about comics as an academic area of interest until I met them. And I thought, wow, all right, this can be pretty serious. And it took a few years, but over time, I slowly started bringing comics into my teaching and research and uh, for the last few years, they've become more central to, uh, to both of those endeavors. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not getting any volume. What from, what from your uh, other scholarly works say, I mean, is it from scratch, you know, your, your approach to comics? Or is there something in the spirit and the approach and the methods from some of your earlier scholarly work that informs the way you study comics today? Um, I think a lot of it just came out of working more toward, working more with uh, Native American literature. So um, I have a chapter focusing on uh, Gerald Visner in the Failed Frontiersman book. I wrote about James Welch in, in a couple of articles and for the dissertation, but it was never a, a central component. And then over time, the longer I've been here teaching and researching, the more I've gone into native literatures. And, and that sort of brings you back to comics because I, I had always been reading comics for fun. And then once I started discovering um, some of the really great indigenous creators out there, I, I thought this, this is the stuff I want to write about. Uh, this is the stuff I really want to work with. And I found that the comics writers were engaging the political and the narrative and the aesthetic issues that I was already interested in. So it just seemed uh, a, a great uh, fit for my interests. And there were very few scholars working in, in that area, uh, uh, sadly. Uh, I wish there were more scholars working in uh, indigenous comics. Um, and so there's, I guess there's, a, there's sort of a place for that scholarship and I wanna, I wanna help develop and, and expand on that, that place. Yeah, great, wonderful. So. Um, in other of your comics work, uh, you've you know worked on Brian Vaughn. Uh, you've got a chapter from the inner city to the interstellar. What kind of, I mean, what can one learn from a chapter like this? Ideally, I, I hope that that people learn that comics are a, a place where serious political commentary takes place. Um, I think everyone, even people who don't read comics. Uh, appreciate the artistry. They they appreciate the aesthetics. Um, they they can appreciate the the value of the storytelling. But I I, I want people to to understand, and, and many comics readers obviously already know this, that comics engage a, a really important. Um, they make a really important political intervention, and it's not just that they engage important political ideas. They do it for. Uh, a popular audience. So for the, the, the Vaughn article, uh, for those who haven't read uh, um, Vaughn's work, please do. Vaughn is amazing. And, and the Ex Machina series is, is part of a larger um, progression where he works with local politics and then up through Saga, he works with an interstellar politics. 
and he engages a kind of political discourse that academics might read in, in academic works and political science students and, and, and people who follow politics might be familiar with, but maybe not so much your, your average casual reader. And artists like Vaughn and, and the various artists he works with are, are taking these complex political ideas and finding a way to deliver them to a non-specialized or non-academic audience and to do so in a way that engages wonderful storytelling and, and beautiful artwork. And so ideally, I, I'd like people to, to see the, you know, the, the, the social importance of, of comics um, in a way that we don't often see. For instance, they, they rarely get, um, held in libraries in the same way. Like if you write a really strong political treatise, you know that every academic library is going to have it. But if you write a really interesting comic book, chances are the libraries won't have it, but the popular sellers will and the popular audiences will find it. Yeah, really fascinating. So you mentioned kind of graphic indigeneity as a space that you're hoping to participate in growing um, and hoping that others will kind of come to and really expand and complicate it. Um, one of your sort of first forays into this area is your chapter, Super Indians and the Indigenous Comics Renaissance. Tell us a little bit about that, yeah. Um, so, for me, a lot of my comics interest goes back to superheroes. And I think the most exciting superheroes right now are the ones being drawn by indigenous artists. Um, they're, they're funny, they're powerful, they are politically important. And so when I wrote that piece, I wanted to do two things. One is to talk about these really great comics heroes, uh, Aragon Stars, Super Indian, Teddy Tso's, uh, Captain Paiute, uh, J. Ojik's uh, Kijiji. There, there are some really great titles out there. And I specifically used that word Renaissance because I wanted to, uh, I wanted to make a callback to the idea of the, the Native American Renaissance, that this idea that uh, following some of the, from the 60s, like uh, like Silco and, and Welch and, and and others, that there's this this renaissance now that now Native authors can be taken seriously, and the running joke has always been that the, the '60s isn't when Native authors started producing good work; it's when literary, prof, you know, literature professors and and awards ceremonies and and um, prize committees started noticing them, and I think we see the same thing here with with comics that. It's not that this is new. It's that, yes, there's a, a flowering and a growing and, and increasing number of artists, but there have been artists working in this regard for, for years now. Uh, one example is John Proudstar's Tribal Force was published in 1997, and it's been republished, but where we're talking now, over 20 years ago, we had indigenous authors creating and publishing work on indigenous superheroes and we're only just now seeing scholarship on it. So finally catching up to the incredible sort of, um, cr sort of creative surge that has been actually taking place for a while, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and it's been taking place in a lot of areas. So you, you also have, for instance, one of my favorite writers is um, uh, Michael Nickel Yangalanis, uh, uh, Haida, uh, artist, his book uh, Red, A Haida Myth, is an amazing and wonderful work. And I sort of came upon that um, accidentally. And then the more I looked into his work, he's also a, uh, an installation artist, uh, an, an illustrator, a graphic designer, uh, a painter. I saw that he's been publishing uh, what we would call graphic novels uh, for several years. Mm -hmm. and they just haven't been picked up by a national press distribution. They haven't been the subject of scholarly works. They, they're only now just getting into uh, classrooms, but you have these, these amazing creators uh, 
who have been working and writing and self-publishing their work all over the place. Another really important piece of yours, um, graphic, right, narrative presentations of violence against indigenous women. So really kind of also turning the lens toward uh, gender issues uh, within the sort of graphic indigeneity space. Yeah. So uh, it's become this, this particular issue, the missing and murdered indigenous women has has been picked up by a lot of uh, indigenous artists over the last few years and quite a few um, indigenous graphic novelists and comics artists have been addressing this. Um, and it's, it's important to note that, again, as with um, the, the, the work that Brian Vaughn does, these are artists who are not putting their efforts into uh, academic works. They're putting them into popular works. They're putting them into works that will get into the hands of a uh, of vast and wide readership uh, of a variety of ages and backgrounds. And, and this is important because the, um, the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women um, sort of movement has been getting very little national or, or, or international uh, attention. So just to throw out two very important statistics, um, one in three of, of all women will experience some kind of gendered violence in their lifetime and indigenous women face a murder rate that is 10 times the national average, uh, 10 times, which is uh, insane. And this is a, a, an epidemic that has gotten very little press, but the artists, so many of the artists in the Dear Women anthology that came out from Native Realities Press, uh, David Robertson and, uh, and, and others who published from High Water Press have put out a number of works, uh, either dealing with uh, specific history, like Betty, the, Hel the Betty Helen Osborne story about an actual woman who was murdered, or fictionalizing it in, in some way. These, these stories keep coming out, and indigenous authors are, are telling these stories, they're making sure their readership knows these stories. And mm -hmm. this has become a major thrust in the creative world. It needs to become a major thrust in the academic world. We need to be publishing on this. We need to be teaching our students about this. We need to be sharing resources, uh, especially those of us who like me, uh, I teach at, at SUNY Potsdam, which um, among other things serves the, uh, the population of the Aquasasana Mohawk Reservation. Mm -hmm. And so this is a, an important issue that, that literally hits home here where I live. So it's the kind of thing we need to be addressing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so speaking of which, you know, how, how do you bring this, uh, how do you bring comics? How do you bring what you were just talking about? Your kind of this really significant, important kind of story and narrative that grow from populations, communities that ha are historically underrepresented, even er actively erased into your classrooms. Uh, yeah. And so I've, matter, yeah. Rec uh, I've recently started teaching a course devoted specifically to the graphic novel. And I bring in some of these titles. So I did a course on superhero comics and we spent two weeks on uh, Aragon Starr's great um, books, uh, Super Indian, where she deals explicitly with reservation politics. And her, uh, she focuses on a, um, a fictional reservation, but of course the economic issues, the racial violence issues, uh, the, the, the holdover of settler colonial ideas, uh, the persistence of, of this machinery, these are universal in terms of indigenous populations. And I've also been regularly teaching courses in Native American literature, where I increasingly bring in pop culture works and, and comics works. And I, I was hesitant to do that at first. Um, and I now feel stupid for having done that, because I find that the more I want to engage these important political issues, the hungrier my students are for it. So uh, I, I've been blessed in that my students want these kinds of works. They are immersed in pop culture and they have a fantastic social conscience. And when, when presented with the opportunity to do this kind of reading, 
they absolutely uh, eat it up. And so it's actually been really easy for me to work these, um, these titles in um, pedagogically because they fit with my own interests. Um, they fit with my desire to use the classroom as a space to talk about about not just the literary arts, but the political and social context around literature. What, what are these artists responding to? Why, why are they writing these pieces? And then why are they making the, the formal and aesthetic choices that they do in order to engage these pieces? Uh, and this is what students, I find, uh, really want. So it's been um, gratifying to know that the more I bring in, the more my students want so the next time i bring in more and then they get hungrier and it's it's actually been a really great experience doing that do you bring in uh kind of mainstream dominant say representations as well to kind of help them understand the significance of the kind of insertion and then writing against or writing you by our indigenous creators absolutely so in my um, superhero comics class, before we started reading Aragon Starr's book, um, I gave them, uh, I sort of showed them a, a presentation. I went through various indigenous characters in mainstream comics from Marvel, DC, Dark Horse, Image, and, and we, we looked at the ways in which they were represented and the various things that were happening. And in addition to the standard well, women are over-sexualized uh, and, and the men far less so, they also found, hey, it doesn't matter when these were published or, or what press was coming out or who was doing the drawing, all of these characters share a very similar type. So there was always some sort of connection to a spirit animal. There was always feathers and or fringe. There was always some version of a uh, traditional instrument of war. Um, there was always some hyper stylized uh, war dance or ceremony that that was involved where everyone else is fighting the heroes need to engage in ceremony first and and it worked really well because um, a the students were able to see this and and recognize this stereotype but the very beginning of Aragon Star's Super Indian she plays on this so she has uh, the first page of the book has a character who is very much this stereotype. And then in the bottom right panel, the character winks and says, but that's not this story. Uh, and then tells a different story with a different hero. And so this, the, the students can see the ways in which these artists are um, frustrated by these, these kinds of representation and then consciously uh, moving on from them, you know, calling them out, uh, directly addressing them. Yeah, that's really great. Um, so I, you've already talked a little bit about kind of methods um, teaching. Is there a particular kind of Donahue trademark to your classroom uh, when you come to teaching comics and pop culture? Yep. Um, it always starts off with a little bit of chaos. Um, I always have a sense of what I want to get to in any particular day. And often that's built off of what we did the day before. But my classes always start uh, with, uh, with the students. So I might ask them what grabbed their attention. I might ask them what, what it is that, that they're noticing on that particular day. And if I'm being honest, I rarely have to ask that question. I will walk into the class and I'll have four or five students throw their hands up and say, we have to talk about whatever this is. So oftentimes that's what I want to focus on that day, which is great, but the, the students often sort of direct where we're starting from. Um, I, I like the students to recognize that they're not just students, they're, they're readers. And, and the difference there is that readers are very much asked to participate in the creation of the story. They're co-creators with the artists. And, and I want them to take some sort of ownership over not just how they're reading, but then how we're discussing these things in class. So my, my trademark is always that I never actually start class. I, I always turn it over to them. And I, I can always sort of massage where I'm going to go. Um, 
the other sort of important method for me is if I'm dealing with politics uh, in the classroom, I have to bring in uh, outside context. There, there's just no way to do it otherwise. So for instance, again, to go back to the class where I taught Super Indian, uh, there's a section where uh, Super Indian is shrunk down and trapped under glass by an evil villain called the Anthro. And many of my students and many of my uh, students in Native American literature classes are anthropology students. They don't quite understand why the anthro is such a villain. So uh, I bring them into a discussion of um, Ishii, uh, commonly called the last Yahi. And we talk about him as a living exhibit at the University of California. We look at some of the photographs and other archival materials online. We might read Visner's essay on, on, um, on, on Ishii and on the politics of visual representation so that when we go into that graphic novel, we get the full range of contextual ideas that the artist is addressing that yes, it's a great superhero story that plays on all of the traditional motifs of hero and villain, but it's also doing so in a way that engages a very important and oftentimes under discussed part of our academic history, the way in which academic institutions build themselves upon the continued machinery of settler colonization of indigenous peoples. Wow, I want to be in your class. Um, <laughs> You're welcome anytime. <laughs> um, so yeah, where so you know, graphic indigeneity. We started the conversation about that and your your deep, very sort of important interest in this area. Um, I'm imagining the vitality in comics today for you would be that space. Can you talk about that and maybe your current work? Uh, yes, I'd love to. Um, so a lot of the current vitality right now is, is happening in uh, small presses and independent publishers. So I would like to give a shout out first off to Native Realities Press and Red Planet Comics who are doing a great job of putting out fantastic series and titles and anthologies. Uh, there are other anthologies coming out, the Moonshot anthologies, the Sovereign uh, Traces anthologies, this place. Uh, and then there's a Canadian press, Highwater Press, which is producing a number of titles by First Nations artists. And I, I, would, I would love for people to go online and check out their catalog and, and order uh, from them. And the more I've been getting um, involved with uh, contacting and ordering from these presses, the more titles I've been seeing, uh, the more links I've been getting to small press publishers. So for instance, Captain Paiute by um, Teddy Tso, uh, he publishes that himself out of his War Paint Studios, which you can visit online and, and, and uh, order from him. And once I started gathering all of these materials, I thought, okay, there's, there, there's, there's something here. Like there's a book project here. And uh, I was working on a project on native futurisms and reading these comics sort of on the side. And then I said, no, I need to put that aside because I have way too much to say. So as I've been collecting these various works, I've been categorizing them and organizing them and seeing a lot of um, genre patterns emerge and so right now i'm uh, a few chapters into a book on uh, indigenous comic books and i have one chapter on superhero comics written uh, i have another chapter on experimental comics written there's some great stuff not only by uh, michael yaglanis but also alanka k harris is doing some really interesting uh, experimental work and i'm going to do a couple chapters one on science fiction narratives, one on historical narratives, um, mostly organizing this by genre because it's helping me to, it's helping me to organize. It's just, there's so much wonderful stuff out there. And, and I think a, a genre approach might be an interesting way to see not just what traditions these authors, these creators are, are writing in, but how they're using that uh, to get at, at, at politics. So the, the science fiction writers aren't just writing escapist fantasy, they're writing very anti-settler colonial 
escapist fantasy. The historical authors aren't just presenting us with the past. Um, there's a series uh, of books out of High Water Press that deals with uh, focusing on individual uh, historical figures. Mm -hmm. So there's a book on Pauline Johnson. There's a book on Louis Riel. There, there are books that focus on these historical figures that need to be taught more in literature and, and history classes. And the press actually uh, encourages people to adopt these for the classroom. So I, I'm hoping that, that this book will give a very brief uh, but necessary introduction to the wide variety of things happening in, in indigenous comics right now. There's just from coast to coast, uh, northern Canada through Mexico, there's just amazing work being produced right now. And, and I, I would like to help introduce the scholarly world to it. Wonderful. Yeah, I can't wait. And of course, we'll be waiting there with our world comics and uh, graphic nonfiction series when you're ready. <laughs> well, uh, thank you. It's a great series. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we need this. We need it um, in all of the different kind of areas that have been traditionally under sort of studied and represented in comics, because I think a lot of people think, oh, even if, you know, if they think um, indigenous comics, they're going to think, you know, mainstream stuff. And if they go even further than that, um, they might just think that, well, you know, indigenous comics are superhero comics or something. But no, there's actually alternative. There's historical, there's autobiographical, there's, yep. yeah, no, I love that. Um, well, and this is particularly important, I think, if I can make one, one final yeah, point, yeah. that in, among the scholars who focus on native literature, there's a lot of great stuff being done on native literature and very little of it addresses comics. And there's a lot of great work being done on comics and very little of it addresses indigenous literature. And so indigenous comics becomes this, 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 this place that is overlooked in many ways because the major scholarly traditions in indigenous studies aren't looking at it. The major comic studies aren't looking at it. And, and it, it's this wonderful, vibrant place. And, and I'm not saying that, that this is unique. There are a lot of other underrepresented uh, groups and, and, and people out there that deserve more study and, and over time are getting more study, certainly. Um, but indigenous comics artists are almost sort of doubly ignored mm -hmm. uh, with, the, with the, the great work that they're doing. Well, um, with that, then uh, James Donahue, SUNY Potsdam, Indigenous Comics Matter. Thank you. <laughs>